right, and welcome. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Tonight is the third of four in a lecture series that I'm presenting for Musicians Wellness. And tonight we are going to be talking about performance anxiety, which is something that I get asked a lot about. Um, and so I wanted to take this time to provide you with some information on why it happens, how it happens, and what we can do about it. So, why? Why do we experience performance anxiety? Why do we get nervous? Well, because we care. We want to do well, right? And we don't want to fail. Failing's never fun. <laughs> so, let's unpack that a little bit. We care. We have worked so hard on the music that we're presenting. We have worked so hard in honing our craft. We've spent a lot of time and energy in it. Of course we're gonna care about it. We respect the composers, the works, and we wanna bring them justice. We want to pr present these materials and music in a way that will share our joy of it. We don't wanna fail. We place a lot of pressure on ourselves, or maybe perhaps it gets placed upon us by other people, whether that be um, teachers or friends, parents, whatever the case might be. We tend to, to put a lot of pressure on ourselves. We don't want to disappoint these people. F you know, fill in the blank. You don't want to disappoint mom. You don't want to disappoint your teacher. And we also have a tendency to tie our performance quality into our self-worth. But that's not the correlation. Performance quality is not equal to self-worth. So what happens when we're on stage and we get nervous? Essentially, the, f the stress response of fight, flight, and freeze, right? Thought you'd appreciate those images. Uh, <laughs> so, so what happens when we experience performance anxiety? Well, we could, we could try to fight it, we could try to run, or sometimes we just plain freeze in the, in the midst of it. This, of course, you probably all know that this is a, um, a response that is supposed to protect our bodies, you know, in case we, we come across a giant bear or something. <laughs> um, however, we don't always realize that these, um, these responses are, are very generic and can happen whenever we feel stressed. So let's, let's kind of break this down a little bit and talk about what is performance anxiety. The definitions of performing, performance anxiety is fear of performing. It's the fear of the unknown, you know, whether you make mistakes or you're wondering what the audience's perception is going to be or your body response, you just don't know. Um, in fact, actually, I, <laughs> just a few moments ago, I, I had this thought. I was like, oh, my gosh, I hope my read is good. I hope my read doesn't squeak on me. And then I was like, wait a minute, I'm not even playing clarinet tonight. <laughs> so that, that actually... Um, was really intriguing to me, realizing that I have, I have some, some stuff to unpack there <laughs> as far as my reads. Um, the fear of, the, okay, so fear can be invoked because of an emotional memory based on previous performance experiences. Have you ever had a performance that maybe you didn't quite, it didn't quite go as the way you wanted it to? I think we can all say that. We have, right? Um, and so those, those do um, become stored within us. And I will talk more about that in just a moment. So fear is an emotion. So we're going to kind of um, explore what happens here, okay? So emotions are instinctive responses triggered by outside events and inside memories of past events, whether they're good or bad. 
So let's say, for instance, you received some flowers from someone you loved as a surprise. Every time you, you see those flowers, smell those flowers, you get that, that trigger, that emotional trigger of happiness. Now, if you were to think about being on stage, would that be an exciting, good, ex you know, emotional response, memory, or maybe not so much? And it's okay if it's either one, it really is. So bad experiences are encoded in our brain as traumas. Emotions are located in the temporal lobe while logic and reasoning are in the prefrontal cortex. So, um, let's see, can you see my mouse? No, yes? Ah, there it is. Okay, so our um, emotional memories are in this pink section right here, whereas our problem-solving reasoning rationale is in this yellow section right here. Okay, so they're in two different parts of the brain. While we are in the fight, flight, freeze response, the prefrontal cortex shuts down. So our emotions run us, or can kind of take over, and our prefrontal cortex, the part that, that deals with reasoning and logic, is, is, is shutting down. It doesn't have as much power. That's the initial response. Now we can train that response, but that's, that's the initial thing that happens. So our emotions start to take over, okay? Remember I talked about performance anxiety is fear of the unknown, fear of performing? So that emotion is going, starts to take over. So as I mentioned, performance anxiety is a stress response. The body perceives performing as a danger or stressor. The, it's a very generic, designed system. It can't tell the difference if you're on stage or if there is a, a bear attacking you. It doesn't matter. Your body is going to respond in the same way with the fight, flight, or freeze response. So when we are in a stressful situation, then we have stress hormones that are released. There are three in particular that, were, um, that I'm going to mention. And I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty as far as what each one does because they work in tandem and a lot of them have the same um, side effects. So they, they really work together um, and they are released m most of the time at the same time. Um, these are adrenaline, um, also known as epinephrine noradrenaline or norepinephrine and cortisol okay so those are the three stress hormones um, the first two adrenaline and noradrenaline are very similar but they have slightly different effects um, adrenaline does affect the heart lungs and skeletal muscles whereas noradrenaline affects the arteries so th that's a, um, a very basic uh, rundown as far as what those do, and we're gonna talk about the combined effects in just a moment, or now. <laughs> um, so what happens when you experience these three stress hormones? Well, we could have a feeling of anxiousness, nervousness, excitement. The, um, these hormones trigger blood vessels to contract and to redirect blood toward major muscle groups like the heart and lungs, which is one of the reasons why our heart starts um, beating faster. We start breathing faster. It can have the uh, ability to increase your attention and focus, which can be a great thing if you can focus on the right things. Um, uh, your blood pressure elevates. The cortisol in particular is responsible for releasing blood glucose or blood sugar. And it's to supply an extra boost of energy. 
um, for your muscles. So I thought that was, that was really intriguing. It expands the air passages of the lungs and, like I mentioned, faster breathing. Enlarges the pupils. The body's ability to main, or excuse me, to feel pain and tension is decreased. I, I may have shared this in one of the, the previous lectures, but I remember having my first um, body mapping teacher ask me, well, what did you feel when you played? And I went on and on uh, talking about, um, well, I didn't like my sound here, and I missed this note here. She was like, no, 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 your body. And I was like, I, I don't know. I don't think about that. And so it was a journey for me to learn how to, to feel my body and respond to it as, as I went along in my journey. These stress hormones also suppress the immune system, which is fine for an immediate response, but this, that, that thing in particular it just reminds me that if we have chronic stress, we're in a constant state of stress, um, that suppression of the immune system can, can really become an issue. So these hormones can actually be a really great thing for you when you're on stage, but if you're feeling them throughout your day constantly um, or very, very often, it can um, be a negative thing for your health. So because these stress hormones are released when we're in this fight, flight, or freeze response, these memories are encoded even more so than any other m emotional memory. They stick there longer, okay? They are more imprinted within our emotional memory. So I thought it might be a little helpful to kind of have this diagram. We start with fear, the fear of the unknown, right? The fear of my reed squeaking. <laughs> um, whatever, what, whatever it might be for you. Then, because of this fear, the body interprets it as a stressful event and triggers stress hormones to be released. When these stress hormones are released, then it gets stored as an emotional memory. And keep in mind, re remember the primitive and generic um, response of the, the system is it, it's designed to protect you from whatever life-threatening life event it may be. And realizing that we rationally understand that being on stage is not a life-threatening event. However, our body doesn't understand that. And so it perceives any danger or fear as, as a, oh my gosh, I have to save your life right now kind of thing. So when we think of being on stage and we're having this emotional response of, of oh no, getting nervous, um, that's because these hormones have been release time after time and you have that memory which is then encoded into anxiety and think about it if if you have one performance where you're experiencing all of this and you go around in a circle and then the next performance it, you go around again you're building potentially you're building the performance anxiety onto performance anxiety and the level of performance anxiety is just raising each time, unless you do something about it. Anxiety is a biochemical over response to stress and stress leads to anxiety. It's, it's as simple as cause and effect. So let's talk a little bit about risk factors for this. If you've had pre previous poor performance experiences, that is, that is a risk factor, factor for more performance anxiety because they've been encoded as traumatic events. If you have anxiety disorders, 
then an anxiety of any sort is going to be most likely going to be spread into performance anxiety too. It's going to trigger that. And then if you keep doing it without addressing the response, then it's going to get more and more. Um, high anxiety and stress levels in everyday lives. Um, I think this is something that is really important for all of us to just take a mental note about. In fact, actually, I've been thinking about it all day. And the, and the reason why is, is it seems like there's always a to-do list. It's hard to find time for yourself, for your family, for whatever to kind of help balance your life. But it's important. And we need to make sure that we're allowing for that to happen. If you have irregular sleep patterns, that's also another risk factor. Our body does need sleep in order for us to, to properly function. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about coping with performance anxiety. One of the things that you can do is talk through previous traumatic experiences, whether that be with a friend um, or a therapist. The more you talk about these, the more it will, you will desensitize the emotional intensity of them. Um, that can be done through, even, even if you don't feel comfortable talking about it with someone, maybe even journaling. There's lots of different methods that you can choose in order to kind of allow yourself to process what you've already experienced. Because the prefrontal cortex, remember that's the part of the, the reasoning and the logic, because it tends to shut down in a stressed state, when preparing for a performance, it's important to have tools at your disposal to bring oxygen back to the higher functioning parts of the brain that will bring reasoning into the situation, okay? So we're, we are going to talk um, about some of these tools, and some of them I will just mention, and, and then there's going to be a few that I, I do talk about a little bit more. But it's important to remember that when we do get in that stress state, it's harder to access that reasoning that we, we have um, because it has a tendency to shut down. Okay, so tools, what can you do? Um, the first thing that I tell all my students is to practice performing, okay? We have to understand what's going to happen when we get on stage. So we kind of need to make ourselves get into that, that nervous state and be like, okay, what's, what's going to happen? Is my read going to freak out? <laughs> or, <laughs> um, you know, trying to figure out what specifically does happen and then you can address it from there. Maybe that's count and mouth. Maybe that's your legs shaking. Maybe that's your hands sweating. Whatever the case might be, you'll know what you'll, or well, you'll know what the problems are and you'll figure out how to address them. The second is redirection. So when something distracts you when you're on stage, whether that be somebody moves or somebody drops something or you see someone and your mind starts going a mile a minute, um, you want to have something you can tell yourself to redirect your attention. Um, it's just like, and you can say, don't think about that, don't think about that, but it's just like if I tell you, don't look at your shoes, you all want to look at your shoes right now. And so we have to find something to tell ourselves to kind of redirect that. So, for instance, if I get distracted on stage, then what I tell myself is I need to think about the music. Am I, am I doing this phrasing justice? And I pour my heart into that. And that's my go-to direction, redirection. And it's important to practice that. We can't remember when we're on stage, it's harder to access 
that prefrontal cortex, the logic, the reasoning. So we have to practice it. It has to become a habit. So talk therapy, I mentioned that. Um, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. So this is um, a method, it's, it's named EMDR, um, and it is often done by licensed therapists, and they have a special certification for this. And basically what this method does is it separates the emotional tie with a memory. So if, there's a, if you've ever experienced um, a traumatic event or performed on stage a lot of times <laughs> and are suffering with performance anxiety, you can work with this person to help under, separate the memory of it with that strong emotional tie. Another tool is meditation. And this can be in so many different forms. Um, one thing that I do uh, for meditation is I do constructive rest, which is um, something that came from the Alexander Technique, where I lie down on the floor and for a little while, and I think about my breathing, and I think about my body, and that significantly helps me to feel my body more as far as what I'm doing when I'm playing, as well as focusing my mind. Breathing exercises. Um, remember what I mentioned earlier, that when we are in this stress response and the prefrontal cortex shuts down, we need to be able to get oxygen back to that space in order for it to um, kind of come back into action. So doing some breathing exercises, of course, I recommend very slow breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth. And it could just be something as simple as that. You're like, I'm just going to think about my breathing, and I'm going to breathe slow. And it doesn't have to be anything um, specific as far as a regimen for it, but it could be as well if you wanted it to be. There are different somatic practices that can help with this. Um, somatic practices meaning um, practices that, that work on the mind and body connection, in particular moving the body. Some of those include Alexander Technique, body mapping, Feldenkrais, um, Ralphing. There's, there's a lot more out there too that I'm sure can be really helpful for some people. So I put beta blockers as last on my list. And the reason why is because it can be helpful for some people to address physical symptoms, such as the heart racing or finger shaking. But that's the only thing it addresses, is the physical response and the physical symptoms. It does not help you process emotionally. It does not help you understand the fear, understand what's happening, it is only one tool, and it's not a. Com I I don't think it's um, a complete tool. It can be helpful for some people, but it's not a fix. Okay, so let's talk about the power of the mind. <clears throat> it is more efficient to acknowledge and process your emotions versus pretending they don't exist. I'm sure you've, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sure you've all heard that when you're on stage, oh, just pretend like the audience isn't there. Just pretend that they're not there. Okay, pretending that they're not there actually takes more energy than just accepting that they're there and, and realizing that they're there because they want to hear you play. That, but as a performer, you're like, yeah, but they're here because they want to hear me play. I'm scared to hear, <laughs> let them hear me play. That's where that fear is. Remember, that's the, that's the trigger for performance anxiety. So I, I do think that there is a lot that we can allow ourselves to process in our minds as far as our attitude towards performing. Your mind is powerful. If you allow yourself to continually be mindful of your internal and external experiences, 
you will be able to respond to the perceived negative effects of stress hormon hormones and performance. So we're going to dive into that in just a little bit as far as um, being mindful of the internal and external experiences. So that will, will come together in a few moments. If we are able to reframe performance anxiety into nervousness, from nervousness into energy and excitement, it will make a big difference. If we're excited to perform this music for the audience, then it's taking out that fear and ideally will lessen the stress response. Okay, so this list is the same list that, um, that I mentioned earlier with the effects of the stress hormones. It's the same list. Now, if we were to kind of remind ourselves of the power of the mind and rethink these effects, we can change our perspective on them. So feelings of anxiousness, anxiousness nervousness, or excitement. What if we chose the excitement? We can do that. We can change that and make it into um, a benefit of these stress hormones. So what if we think about redirecting the blood and the blood vessels towards the major groups like the heart and lungs? Awesome, I can breathe better. Sweet. Increased attention. If you know me at all, you know that I desperately need that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that could be a, a, a great benefit that we're able to do that. Heart rate heart rate increases okay so we're excited let's 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 do this let's get pumped blood, blood pressure elevates well it's just because I'm excited <laughs> um, let's see let's keep going down here the, the I find this interesting about the pupils dilating um, I I I am not certain what that does for our vision, but I, I get the feeling that it can help us see more, just based on my own experience. Now, this is purely, you know, my, my experience and my um, uh, perception, but I think that it can be um, something that does well. So, the body's ability to feel pain and tension is decreased. Okay. Well, we can learn how, to, do, how to, to tap into that. Suppresses the immune system, great. I don't have to worry about getting COVID. <laughs> okay, so we can, we can redirect our minds into thinking that some of these are really positive effects, okay? And, and I think it's... A, it's it can be it can be really uh, an attitude changer for for you. Okay, so we are going to dive into one of the things that I that was in a previous slide: inclusive attention. Um, inclusive attention is derived from body mapping, and because I teach body mapping, I know this well, and I have known that this will um, be beneficial and can be beneficial for many people. And what it is, is basically allowing yourself to experience what's happening inside your body as well as what's happening outside your body, okay? So when you're performing, you'll be ideally, and this, is, this has to be practiced, but you'll be able to process what you're feeling, if you can feel tension, if you can feel your heart rate, um, as what you're thinking, um, as well as what's happening in the audience. There's, there is an audience there. I accept them. They will make noise. They're going to move. A program might fall on the floor. There may be somebody who opens up a, a, a candy and they're trying to do it really slowly, you know, to, to make less noise, but it just lasts longer. 
We've all been there, but we can't let those things distract us, right? So we have to learn how to um, be able to take in that information and allow us to stay focused. So this, um, this term is defined as to be consciously mindful of intrinsic and uh, extrinsic factors. And like I mentioned, we do need to practice that first. If we allow ourselves to th think about our surroundings when we're in a practice room and accept our surroundings while we're in a practice room, we're going to have a better chance of doing that on stage. What I mean by that is, have you ever felt self-conscious about your practicing when, when you know that your friend's right next door or even that there's a person next door? I think that we all have had some, some feeling of that, you know, as far as, okay, what's happening around me? Or maybe they get distracted. You hear somebody, uh, another instrumentalist of, of your instrument playing something, and you're like, oh, they sound great. They sound great. Oh, I need to practice. <laughs> you know, we get distracted by those things, and, and, and usually our go-to is, I can't think about them, or I shouldn't be thinking about them. But what if we just accepted it? Like, we accept that the audience is going to be there. If we accept it and just allow it to be, then we'll have a chance of be, being able to do that when we're on stage. Okay, so how can we practice inclusive attention? First, we need to make sure we have all of our senses mapped, which, don't worry, we'll get into that in a moment. And then also train the perception of these senses, um, basically by asking a lot of questions. Okay, so these are our seven senses, not five, seven. So we have smelling, tasting. These are on the, um, on the lower half because we don't necessarily need those while we're playing music. And then we have these five up here. We have seeing, hearing, touching, movement, and balance. A lot of times, these three, the movement, touching, balance, tends to um, get kind of lumped together or maybe not even mapped at all. And they, they are very valid senses, and we need to make sure that we include them whenever we're preparing. So these are the scientific names for them. Of course, we know visual, auditory, the touch is tactile, movement is kinesthetic, and then the balance is vestibular. And then these are the receptors, okay? So obviously we see with our eyes, we hear with our ears, we touch with our skin, we can sense our movement based on the sense receptors that are in the muscles and connective tissue at joints. And connective tissue in the fascia, which is throughout the whole body. Um, and then we hear, uh, we're able to hear because of the receptors that are in the vestibule of the ear. So if we're trying to train the, the perception of these senses, we're going to need to ask ourselves lots of questions. Where? Where is our body in space? Where is my hand? Where are my fingers? Where are my feet? Where's the weight in my feet? Is it here or there? And, and answering that specifically. Then how? What's the quality of the movement? What's the quality of, of the tactile touching? What's the quality of um, the, my finger movement as I'm, as I'm playing? Am I fl are my fingers flying up? Are they staying close? Do I feel balanced? Do I feel off balance? Is the quality easy or effortful? Do I feel free or tense? Light or heavy? After we do this for a while, we will be able to take this next step in the training, which is sensitivity, discernment, responsiveness. These right here are what we're aiming for in performance. 
sensitivity, discernment, responsiveness. So what that is, we're going to use an auditory example first. The sensitivity is, I hear the note I'm playing. Great. Good. We should hear the note we're playing. Then discernment. I sense that the note is sharp. Okay. Great. Now what? <laughs> Response. I bring the note back in tune. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this, but I know that I have, that I have, especially early on in my performing days, I noticed that I was getting really sharp. So I was at that discernment stage. I was like, I'm getting really sharp. I need to pull out at my next rest. But then at the next rest, I was so worried about how I looked that I was, and I was like, you know, trying to look pleasant and make sure that I didn't look lost or sad or scared. <laughs> that I forgot to pull out. Oops. <laughs> so, so then I kept playing and I kept getting sharper and sharper and sharper and I wasn't able to respond to that in the moment. Well, I, ha I now re realize that I need to sometimes write reminders in there, but most of the time I can remember to do it anyway, to pull out at rests or to adjust the pitch with, with my oral cavity. So that's what we're aiming for. So now to put it into another perspective, let's talk about the kinesthetic sense. Sensitivity. I feel my body as I play. Great. I'm not sure if we can all say that. <laughs> um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, my first body mapping teacher asked me, well, how'd you feel when you played? And I told her all these things about the music and how I played the music, but nothing about my body. And when she asked about my body, I had no idea. So then... Whenever I um, went on stage one time and I finally was able to feel some tension, I felt the tension in my legs. I was so excited. I went to her the next day and I was like, I felt the tension in my legs. She was like, great, could you let go? No, but I felt it. <laughs> and that was a big step for me. That was a big step for me. So I had made it to the discernment. But, and eventually I was able to get to the responsiveness. It's a process and it takes time. So as far as the kinesthetic sense, if we have the I feel my body as I play for the sensitivity, the discernment could be something like I sense my fingers are straight and not curved. And then if, if you can get to that responsiveness, I curve my fingers. So you, you're able to sense what's happening, you know exactly what the problem is, and then you fix it. That's the ideal. So I wanted to kind of just mention some takeaways. Just kind of wrapping this up, reviewing a little bit of what we've done, and, and hope that you take away this information tonight. Accept that your body will respond differently when we perform because adrenaline, norepinephrine, and cortisol changes how our bodies respond. It pushes us into the stress response of fight, flight, freeze. Allow yourself to process your emotions towards performing. It is more efficient to recognize they exist and to address them than to pretend they don't exist. Remember, you want to accept the fact that the audience will be there. Ignoring the audience or trying to pretend they're not there is not going to do you any good. Inclusive attention can be a useful tool to learn how to respond to the changes from stress hormones during performances. You can learn to take control back. While implementing new tools, you may feel scatterbrained at first, but that is completely normal. Like I mentioned earlier, if you're in the practice room and you're thinking about someone who's next door, or you're thinking about, oh, I wonder who can hear me. If, and you, if you don't accept those thoughts as your practice, then you're not going to be able to do it in performance. But also, when you're practicing and you're doing that, you may feel scatterbrained. You may feel like, oh, wow, I just missed that F sharp. I've never missed that F sharp before. That's weird. But realizing that, okay, well, you're, you're asking your body to do a lot more. You're asking your mind to accept things in a way that is ne and, and to process things in a way that is probably never done before. 
So realize that there's going to be a lear learning curve to that. But just because it's a challenge doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Don't forget to pay attention to all the necessary senses. Don't forget about movement, balance, touch. Your mind is powerful. If you allow yourself to continually be aware of your internal and external experiences, you will be able to respond to the perceived negative effects of stress hormones within performances. Choosing is a choice. If you choose to take the nervousness or the nerves and turn them into a more positive outlook, such as excitement, will help you train your mind that you are not in a life-threatening situation when you're on stage. There is one more remaining lecture in this series, and that will be on Sunday, April 24th at 6 p.m. here in Marsh. I would like to thank you all for your attention today, and thank you for coming. Thank you.